I don't need introductions here. You know Big Ivan Little, the only man who tried to headbutt the Reverend Ian Paisley, but Paisley got his retaliation in first. You know, Alison Morris, um, well, Irish News then, Belfast Telegraph, and uh, specialised commentator and analysis, now going into podcasts. I almost said broadcasts, but she'd have broken both my legs. And big Gary MacDonald, the phantom piper from the Irish <laughs> News, the business editor, they say that St. Patrick in 400 AD scared all the snakes out of Ireland. Gary, when he starts playing the bagpipes, scares them, scared them out after that. And uh, I'm just an old punter who's still around. Um, from the days whenever Fleet, well, Donegal Street was called the Fleet Street of Belfast. And in those days, just for a quick run through synopsis, the Irish News is still here. That was founded in 1891. Um, it's moving around to the Fountain Centre, uh, well, because of economic reasons, but um, it's still the only newspaper office of the four main blocks of newspapers that were in Donegal Street. There was, of course, the old Northern Whig, which was founded in 1824. Um, sorry, and was closed down in, in uh, 1963. That's the old Whig building, it still stands there. There was a newsletter in the old Peacock building, which is still there, unfortunately. The old Peacock, the sculpture of the Peacock on the front balcony got dundered whenever the bomb was outside the newsletter. Uh, yeah, I think it was 1972. And then um, there was, there is uh, obviously <clears throat> the Belfast Telegraph, which is still going and which is in the corner of Royal Avenue and Donegal Street. They were the four kind of cornerstones of Belfast Fleet Street. We'll go into later about why <clears throat> I would say that the Fleet Street in Belfast, so-called, was much more, was much better than the Fleet Street in London. But we'll deal with that later. And well, first of all, in, in the old days, in the old days, what happened was you went out and kind of served your time in, in uh, what, the, what were called the provincials. The Portie Down Times that Ivan was in, Banbridge, Cornwall, Gary, and the Anditown News, North Belfast News. Like, um, uh, that was what you did. You, you went out and then you came in to Belfast to work for the main papers. Now, they weren't just the, the Irish News, Belfast Telegraph, um, the Newsletter, and the Northern Week in Belfast at that time. The Bureau of the main British national papers, Daily Mail, Daily Mirror, Daily Telegraph even, um, they were all in, in, in Donegal Street. They had, they had satellite offices, bureau, either in Donegal Street or just off it. Mind you, most of those bureaus in those days, from the boys from across the water, they ran their offices from the pubs, from Benny's Bar, from the Duke of York, from, from McLeod's or whatever. But they were all based in Fleet Street <clears throat> around that time. So if we can start with Ivan, Ivan, you were in the telly before you went into broadcasting, but you wouldn't remember the Telegraph in its heyday when it was selling during the year of the so-called Troubles. Yeah, yeah. Over, well, well over 100,000 copies. Absolutely. I mean, I, I moved to the Telegraph. I didn't want to be a journalist in the first place. I'm well, we know that. Be, be honest, and I don't know if I ever became one, but <laughs> I, I did the journalist course with Jim here. And the first one ever in Belfast, and the less said about that, probably the better. <laughs> um, but I, I had been accepted into Strammillis Training College, where my first wife was, was going to study. And then Joan Fitzpatrick, our, our journalism lecturer, who sadly passed away just uh, earlier this month at the age of 97, she asked me to go for an interview in Portadown to tick the box so it would look as if her students were getting out to do interviews. So I went down there, I met David Armstrong, the editor, and we hit it off immediately. And I thought, well, sure, I'll give this a go. Um, and I, I, I worked there for, for two years and was so lucky to work with, I think, the best journalist I've ever worked with, and that includes all the guys I worked with in ITN, Victor Gordon. Victor taught me more in a morning than I learned in the year at the college. But after a while, I was getting married and I thought, well, Portadown had been very quiet, but then it started to get pretty, pretty serious. The, the UVF and UDA had come out 
of the shadows and the murders were, were going on all the time. So it came up. I went to um, Belfast for an interview and how I got the job I'll never know because I got off the train and walked up Royal Avenue and it was rag day and my one suit was covered, I was covered from head to toe in flour and I tried to get it off but I went and saw Eugene Wason for my interview <laughs> covered in flour <laughs> and somehow I got the job and that was it. I, I was in the reporting staff and my, they were it's hard to imagine just how bad it was, but this was um, in 72, 73, and there was so much going on, we could not we could hardly cover it. We had a, a radio room set up in the Telegraph where we took turns and we went in and monitored the police radio. And if it was a bomb that there was no casualties, you reported it <coughs> to the desk. But if there were casualties, and there frequently were, told the desk and they would try to get somebody out to uh, to cover it. But it was day and daily. And I, I vividly remember one day I wrote a story, a rap story for the Monday on 10 murders that there'd been in Belfast over the weekend. 10. And not one of them made, the, not a line of it made the front page of the paper because something had happened, I can't remember what it was, but something happened on the Monday that pushed uh, my story at, uh, into the inside pages. But it was that bad. But, you know, it, uh, well, it was bad. It was a, a hell of a time, you know, because we all, I don't think it was as a result of the troubles that we drank because I'd been drinking heavily for <laughs> years before the troubles. But we did drink. We did drink and we had a lot of crack because we did, the, the Telegraph in those days, the deadline was 12 o'clock. So you had your afternoons basically free. So McGlade's was where we spent our day, our lunch hours and our late lunch hours and our early teas and early evenings. And as Jim said, all the all the characters from the 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 British papers who were there, we just had a had an absolute ball. And Jim, you, you could persuade McDole to have the odd the odd pint, you know, just yeah. just once in a while. Yeah. Jim, would have <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, <laughs> yeah. and by the way, my name's McDole. How many years have you known me, McDole? But I'm being polite. These people uh, don't want to hear. Alison, um, Ivan mentioned deadlines there in the telly, which was putting out 14 editions a day, country editions, city editions, the fourth, the sixth, the eighth, telly up, telly up. Newsboys selling papers in the corner. Alison, uh, the deadlines in morning papers were completely different. Yeah. I remember going, being up at Bally Murphy in the bull ring, reporting riots until four o'clock in the morning because the newsletter, I was a cub reporter in the newsletter, the newsletter were still putting out an edition at six o'clock in the morning, mainly because it was in Donegal Street and all the shipyard and the shorts workers were coming down from the Shangle or whatever through the town to go to work and they would be picking up, not a lot of papers, but thousands of papers. But Alison, whenever you were out in the street reporting, if it was a shooting or a bombing, the deadlines just stretched, didn't they? When I when I first went, I did the the journalist course. When I went to do it, I actually hadn't even enrolled to do the journalist course. What happened was, I knew that I had it in my head that I was going to do that. I was getting made redundant from the job, and she was giving me a couple of quid, and I thought, I'll go and try and do it now, because it was full time, and I had small children. but. At that time, Alan Whitsett, who some of you might remember, he was in charge of the, the journalist course. And I drove, I dropped my kids to school and drove over. Went in, it used to be over on the Ravenhill Road, over in the Biffy, over there. Went into the, um, into the office, walked upstairs, and he said, well, you know, it was like the 1st of September or something, the course was starting. And he says, well, you know, it's booked up for three years, but someone has dropped out at the last minute. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was before, the, let's say it was before the Me Too movement, and Alan Whitsett was a man who probably in today's politically correct world wouldn't have survived very long. So I think you had a notion <laughs> for me anyway. So he said, he, he gave me like a quest and he says, go and get a work placement because I have no work placements. And if you could be back here by 12 o'clock with a work placement or by lunchtime with a work placement, I'll let you go on the course. So I just drove over to Dandy Town, walked into Dandy Town News, asked to speak to the editor, didn't he know who it was? And he came out and said, this man said he let me be a journalist. My hair and a ponytail and the big hoop earrings, pure West Belfast mill bag, like, I'm going to be a journalist, will you sign that? And he just went, yeah, and Robin Livingstone signed it and I drove back over and he gave me a notebook and a pen, told me to sit down and that was how I ended up. But my work placement in the Andy Chinese, that was like 98, 99, 
And at that time, it was obviously the start of the agreement. There was so much going on in terms of policing and decommissioning and everything else. And all the other people, the students in my class, the majority of them went to those week provincial, provincial sort of weekly papers. And they were being sent to cover, you know, fates and furs and kids' events. And because the Andy Town News was so short-staffed, they were sent me down to pick up P.O. Neal statements. And when I came back after my work placement, you want to see the mad stuff that I'd been reporting. Um, but whenever I came back, they phoned me and said they were short-staffed and would... I do, with the Andy Town News asked me what I do shifts. I went and said to Alan Whitsitt and he said, you'll learn more there than you ever will sitting in here. Come in on a Friday to do your law and your shorthand and apart from that. So my going back to full-time education lasted from September till January. And once I'm done my work placement in January, I started working in full-time in the Andy Town News and never went back apart from to do my exams. But the, at that time you're talking about rats and deadlines. Mm -hmm. Well, the peace process had happened and in West Belfast, where I was from, you could already start to see the benefits of it. They were building new buildings, building new shopping centres. But in North Belfast, in those interface areas, it was much harder to solve the sectarian war. You know, the, the political war was easy, but those interface areas, you had all the parading disputes. And I spent more time standing at orange parades and at rats, trying to dodge bricks and plastic bullets and water cannons, sometimes extremely unsuccessfully, as the scar on my face will show you. Um, that at one point I'd been to so many orange parades that year. I remember standing in my garden hanging washing on the line and the neighbours were having a barbecue because it was the middle of July and they went really quiet and their, their voices had stopped speaking and I realised I was singing the sesh, hanging my washing <laughs> on the line because I'd been to so many parades. <laughs> or <laughs> or um, once I moved, and I was in Nanny Chinese for like six years and at that stage I covered Holy Cross as well, 2001, which was a pure baptism affair, like after that. Um, you know, that, that made me realise that what I wanted to do was security journalism. I didn't know what kind of journalism I wanted to do. I don't think anyone does when they first go no, into it. Unless that. maybe they want to be a sports journalist. And like, if there's anyone here knows any sports journalists, we treat them like PE teachers, don't we? They're not like real teachers. <laughs> they're, not like real, <laughs> they're not like real journalists. Because it's a hobby for them. It's what they like doing. It's not really work. But, the, um, but then I realised that that was when I wanted to do the crime and security stuff. And I, I, it was what I found that I was good at. It didn't scare me. I wasn't afraid of it and it, it was something. But I did. They sent me then with a work placement stu a student over the Ardoin to cover Holy Cross and it had been going on for, I mean, people remember it went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Once 9-11 happened, the press took off and it was only us, just the local journalists, BBC and UTV and stuff covering it. And I'm standing with a sweet fella from the country and when I looked around he was gone and I couldn't find him. And I'm like, okay, I've got the work placement killed. Where is he? Because he had wandered. I thought if he's wandered into Glen Brennan and told him he's, you know, with the the Andy Town News, I'll just kill him. Like where he's dead. So it took me about three hours, and I was actually going to phone work and say, I found I've, I've killed the work placement. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do. <laughs> when up he came, wondering where somebody who thankfully some loyalist found him and decided that it was uh, better to take him back where he found him rather than keep him down there, and they handed him back to me. But the, the deadlines that we had then, you could have extended them on because the, the printing press, and then when I moved to the Irish News, they printed their own paper, so you could have pushed the deadline on. Now, everything is so automated and everything has to be done and it's regimented. And the Belfast Telegraph's digital first, so a lot of our stories will go online about eight or nine o'clock at night that are meant for the paper the next day. Um, and once you get to a certain time, you cannot get a story in the print edition. It will only go on to the online edition. There are a lot of scurrying around this week. When you think about that police officer was shot at eight o'clock. By 10 past eight, quarter past eight, you know, we had more or less the details of it. But there was a real scurry to try and get people to OMA and to try and get that to make sure that that was as much detail as possible on the front page for the next day. But then during the evening, like we're updating the online edition sure. once the print edition had already gone. Sure. Guy, we'll come to the online edition. You mentioned sports reporters. Michael, <laughs> Michael Stewart sitting up at the back up there. And, uh, teachers, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Stewart's two, two relatives by marriage were the infamous Patty and Alex Toner of the Daily Mirror. And if we started telling stories about both of them, we'd be here well, until tomorrow morning. But um, Gary then, Banbridge Chronicle and straight in, Irish News. I'm a, no, no, I'm a country boy. Uh, unlike uh, you know, I, I didn't do that early uh, stuff that I, that I even Allison is uh, Al actually Allison must have been offended when he said this is veterans of journalism <laughs> tonight and Allison is she should not be there. I'm, I'm I started. That's what's I started my career in the Banbridge Chronicle, a very sedate country town, 1979, coming up in 44 years ago. Um, I left school on a Thursday. There was an ad in the paper for a trainee reporter. I finished my last 
mock A level exam, halfway through A levels. Uh, I phoned the editor. He says, um, he I come in and see me the next day. And uh, I went into Andy Dolohan. I didn't even know his name. And I come in, went to see him the Friday. And it was not what you know, who you know. He knew my family. All my uncles were involved in the building trade. They were involved in uh, stuff that he knew. And he, I'll give you a start. He never asked me a question about me. The, it was right, he did. He asked me, what school do you go to at Bamberg's Academy? That was the only question he asked about me. Nothing. I didn't even know what money I was earning. That's by the by. Uh, but my first real, so I worked in the Bamberg's Conical from 1979, and then I moved to the Ulster Star. But in 1989, I, I moved to the Mid Ulster Mail in Cookstown. I was appointed editor, and I, that's I was 26, and I was a young editor, and those were brutal days. And in uh, in in that time, I remember um, 1990, 1991, 1992 T-ban, and I remember on my paper, for 13 weeks in a row, we had a killing or a funeral, or a bombing or something on the front page in a weekly newspaper in Cookstown in the early 1990s. Terrible times. Uh, but you get on with it. I was the editor of the paper. I had to make the decisions. And um, and when I was still young, I thought, I need to, you know, all this is awful. And I thought, it has to be. And in the middle of the mail, which is a, a regional local newspaper in Cookstown, at that stage selling... 17,000 newspapers a week and I thought I'd introduce something like business, different things, entertainment, uh, Nige T, yeah, he'll know who, who I mean by Nige T um, and we tried to do something different in the paper and that's really where I got into business journalism and then from there I moved to Ulster Business, uh, a, a magazine and I've been the Irish News Business Editor from the year 2000, so it's just 23 years, it's a long time. So. I didn't serve my time covering what was going on in Belfast, but in the country. And I remember even in the Bambridge Conical days, we had several bombings, killings in the town. But that Cookstown era in Mid Ulster, and as well as T-Ban, we had the Sean Fox stuff, we had the Clano, uh, lots of stuff. People here might know that. Terrible times, but busy times. I get in the newspapers because I. Even though it came from the Gosworks, Donegal Pass, went to a good school, was playing number eight for Ulster Schools, and the then editor of the um, the newsletter, uh, Con Watson, a now tank commander from the Eighth Army during the war, Desert War, um, he was a big rugby fan. I went for my interview, and he essentially said, "Sit down there," and ten minutes later, he said, "You've got the job." But he said, see you next time. Or if you're coming here to work as a reporter, he said, see that memorial clock at Ravenhill? It never works. Get them to fix. That's your first job in here. Get them to fix that bloody clock at Ravenhill so we can tell what time scores are in the match. But those were the days, 1968, 69. The real start of the troubles. Some people still say I started them. But those were the days and deadlines. When, as I say, we were still out in the streets, murders. I remember standing in Tennant Street, barracks one night, and a top policeman. I mean, the, things were so bad, what was happening, crossing to the Ardoin, Chief Street, the shootings, everything. Lenny Murphy, the shankle butcher, was running about the place, murdering innocent people, him and his gang. And I remember a top policeman standing in Tennant Street, and he was wrecked, and he just said, listen, see in here. We are up to our knees in blood. And that's what it was like during those times. But there were lighter moments. If you were stuck up in Bally Murphy at the bull ring, the, the, the soldiers would charge the rioters, the rioters would charge the soldiers before guns came out or whatever. And there was an old news editor in the news editor called Bertie Sibbett. And of course, no mobile phones or anything like that in those days. So you had to find somewhere every hour where we would phone and say, Mr. Sibbett, this is what's happening, this is what's happening. But it was repetition, repetition. So Ray Manna, who was a great old grizzled reporter, hack in those days, he had got this scheme where he knew a taxi driver who was, well, the taxis were on account to the newsletter in those days. And there was a hotel opposite the Europa Hotel, now, well, well in the other corner. It was called Hamill's Hotel. So him and I would jump in a taxi, get down to Hamill's Hotel, 
and there was a little private booth in it, just like McGlade's, where you could file your copy. You could lift the phone, go through to the office, reverse charge, of course. And we had a tin in the, in the little um, telephone box full of pebbles, full of stones. So we be on the Mr. Sibbett, not every hour, we'd stretch and say, couldn't get their phone box, no phone box working up here. But as I was talking down the phone, the Mr. Sibbett saying, the army are charging up the building again. The rioters are throwing petrol bombs at them and stones. Terrible scene, rioters scene. Ray would be rattling the stones <laughs> in the biscuit tin. Oh, Mr. Sibbett, hold on, they're still in the phone. They're still in the phone box now, they're still in the phone box. But <laughs> you got away with that because nothing would change by the time you get up there. And the button wouldn't be, on, wouldn't be pressed on the press until about five o'clock, maybe even some mornings, six o'clock. But all the, the newspapers who were based, in the, the home newspapers who were based around Donegal Street, they all had their printing presses in the back of the building. The Irish News had its own printing press, the news editor, the Belfast Telegraph. And as young reporters, if you stood there whenever that press, we had a big Vickers press in Century Newspapers. And whenever that started rumbling, and the papers, it was a living organism. It was beautiful to watch people's triumphs and tragedies coming off the big steel rollers and the ground underneath your feet was like rolling thunder. And you stood there and it was magic to you. You thought, this is why I'm in this game. And well, not to report deaths and tragedies, triumphs, but the, the, in the circumstances we were working in. But it was absolutely wonderful. Although I will tell you one little vignette about the Belfast Telegraph. My wife, Lindy, worked for the Belfast Telegraph for 24 years. And whenever they got their new presses in, long ago before Sir Anthony O'Reilly bought the place and took it over, um, they, it was owned by Bairds and then, and then uh, um, other people took it over. And then Sir Anthony O'Reilly took it over. But he ordered a big new press at the back of the Belfast Telegraph. And all the great and good were down there with their champagne flutes for the first running of this new press. But no one had noticed that a stray cat had got in through the back gate. So <laughs> the button was pushed in the press and they were all standing there with their champagne and their gin and and all the rest. And the first edition, the first pages that flew off the press had this beautiful impression of a cat all over the front page. <laughs> and it got caught up in the, in the press. So... Um, there was, a, there was a rush to get to the toilets, the WCs at that stage. But those were the kind of days where there were characters. And I want to move on to that a bit, folks. About the Irish News had, had some great characters. James Kelly, who was still writing um, a column when he was 100 years of age. Uh, and, and, you know, um, had the, the Irish News even had a party for him. We'll come back to that later. For the 80th anniversary. Of, of, of him starting as a cub reporter in the paper. But there were people like Tom Samways, I mean, who, who were legends. Well, I know some of those legends, but actually, um, and there's someone in the room who will know this person, we still have a, a guy working for us who has worked in the Irish News for 55 consecutive years. Mm. 55 years. David Gannam, he's our editor's editor. And he joined in 1968, and David has such a rich vein of stories to this day. We had a few drinks a couple of weeks ago. He had his 70th birthday, but he started in the Irish News when he was 15. He is still working for the Irish News to this day, most continuous. I don't know anybody in any company anywhere who will work for the same company for 55 years consecutive. So he's there, but... I mean, only last year, the, the chairman, Mr Fitzpatrick, who had owned the Irish News for years, died. And when I first went in, we had like an induction and he used to come in and speak um, the, to the, the new recruits. And I remember him coming in and he'd ask everyone their name. And from that day, that man would remember everyone's name. And he would come over to you if you'd done a really good story or something that got picked up. But he'd come over and the first thing he would ask was, you know, how's your kids, how's your family? And then he would say, what a great story. Always beautifully dressed and beautifully turned out, Mr Fitzpatrick. And that building was so lovely to work in because a lot of people... If you went into the Irish News, you only go into that front office bit. But inside, mm -hmm. as Gary will know, was full of... Mr Fitzpatrick was an art collector and it was full of beautiful art on all of the walls because it overspilled. So all the floors, when you went up to them, there was this like, gorgeous, beautiful art everywhere. It was just a picture to where it wasn't. It was a dream uh, to work I, I, in. It's such a gorgeous building. Uh, before you go, Dave, and, and, and the sad part of it is the Irish News is moving out of that building 
in oh, the next couple of months. It's the last one. Last yeah, where the last newspaper left, um, the Irish news that that now the facade of the building is uh, it's it's listed, so that's fine, but the building's been sold. The Irish news is moving on. So if you look at that sort of from the Irish news down the street, Belfast Telegraph, you said her on right down to the Northern Whig, um, in three months' time, yeah. there'll be no newspapers left in Donegal, Donegal Street, Street, which yeah. is sad. Yeah, Ivan, now so, broadcasting, I'm, I'm sure... Okay, yeah, but we the, could the, just the, the Telegraph, we, the, our, our real character wasn't even a journalist, it was Bobby Young, who was a copy taker. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby was legendary, every 12th of July, and you still laughed at it. Bobby got, hold, whoa, hold the front page. What is it? I'll send it through. And it was said, two, two lodges have pulled out of the parade. Turf Lodge and so on. And it was always the t same two areas of Belfast. But Bobby was just... A, and Malcolm Brody, the f stories famously took, because he, he was great to give copy to, because he would have corrected. He said, you said that three paragraphs ago. Yeah. Right, OK. And Malky was writing, ringing from Portugal or some Northern Ireland had struggled to a dr draw against Portugal. And Malky went, OK, Bobby, all right. Magnifico, magnifico, magnifico. <laughs> and Bobby said, I heard you the first time, Malky. <laughs> and this, this was and f the most ridiculous thing that ever happened in a newspaper in Belfast was the Belfast Telegraph opened a social club on the top floor. We had a pub. That was on I the top the floor. Really oh, must have you, never, you never were there, Alison. <laughs> but, I, I, I've been there. You but were. It, it was ridiculous. So it was like because you would finish your work and you'd go up and everybody and there were fights and there were rows, <laughs> and several of us were quite openly admitted we were threatened threatened with a sack <laughs> because we fought and we insulted a certain uh, <laughs> member of management. <laughs> And the two lads I was with on the Monday morning were called in but by Roy Lilly, who also sadly passed yeah. away recently, God rest his soul. And they were they came out and said, We've just been we've just been told we're gonna to be sacked if we do it again. So I went home <laughs> and I stayed off. I rang in sick for two weeks and I thought I'll go back in here. Won't be a word about it. <laughs> Sat in the seat on the Monday morning and uh, Roy Lilly's secretary said, I haven't and he threatened me with a sack. But Bob Young would write poetry about this and he kept writing and poetry and poetry and poetry. So you knew your sins were going to be immortalised in Bob's, <laughs> uh, Bob's poetry. Very, very, very few of my work was ever phoned in the copy taker, but I remember having to go and do a, 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 go and do a concert review, which you just did to get free tickets to the concert. And it was uh, Elton John, and I had started about he, you know, he played all these songs from his new album. And I'm standing in the hall of the audience, and I said, and as he entered into Rocket Man, and this wee posh woman went, "Are you quite sure you want to say as he entered into Rocket Man?" That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, probably not. <laughs> yeah. Sports, sports, sports editors and sports editors and headlines, um, headlines which have gone wrong or went wrong on purpose. Um, I was the uh, rugby, boxing, athletics correspondent. For the news editor in the old Sunday News at the time, George Yes was a sports editor. Yes was notorious for his gambling and getting into trouble. He used a system of rolling money. He'd borrow money off Barney Eastwood, and whenever he owed him five grand, he'd go to Sean Graham and buy borrow five grand off Sean, then go to wee Joe McKee so that he could keep the money running. But we had a new editor in the news letter after Con Watson retired. He actually didn't retire. He, Drove out of the back gate full one night and smashed five cars on the way down to Albert Street. Had to go. This new editor came in and his son was going up to Oxford uh, after the summer. He was going up to Oxford and he came into George in the sports desk one Sunday afternoon and he said to George, uh, George, uh, look, 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 what's, what are you leading your back page with? In those days, the newsletter was a broadsheet. And George said, Well, we've got a a derby between the Glens and the Blues at the Oval, which ended in a riot. He says, Dennis O'Hara's got the Irish Open golf to, to go on the back page. And we've got the rugby also. We're playing Connacht that weekend. And then this new editor said, oh, no, George, no, no, no. He said, the boat race has to go. My son's going up the Oxford. And the boat race has to go uh, on the back page. And George turned around to me and said, Cub, what fucking boat race? <laughs> he said, I said, George, it's a Cambridge, Oxford, Cambridge boat race. And, you know, and he said, all oh, right, 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 Mr. Editor. That'll go on the front page. 
I didn't know George was going to the Cheltenham races for the next week on his expenses, on his editorial expenses. He wouldn't be there for a week. But George says to me, it was about half six at night, he said, away up into the Creed Room, in those days, all your pictures from the Press Association or whatever came through a system called the Creed. It was like a, a photocopying machine, an advanced, well, an early photocopying machine. And he says, give me that picture of that wee, that wee, I'll not use the word he used, that wee fella who sits in the back of the boat with the pieces of string in his hands. And he steers the boat and he says, all them big men are pulling the oars with their veins sticking out like oak trees. I said, George, wouldn't you be better with an action pick like that for the front, for the back page of the newsletter? No, 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 whenever they lift that wee so-and-so, he says, the end of the race, and they throw him into that river, what do you call it? I says, the River Thames, George. He says, get me that picture. And he says, I went up and got it for him. And he was, in those days, you had to draw out the pages, your old rulers, and that you drew out the pages, put your picture in your headlines. He says, away home, half six at night, well, at 12 o'clock at night, I got this anguished phone call. We Sport Madol was the print overseer, no Bobby Madol, no relation of mine. He says, get a taxi and get in here. And I says, what's the score? He says, I've stopped the print run. He says, because of the proprietor, Captain O.W.J. Anderson, sees this paper and it even goes on to one, in the one news agent. We're all sacked, it'll close the paper. And I said, Sport, what's the problem? What's the problem? He says, get down here now. You're going to have to change the front page. George had gone off in the middle of the back page of the newsletter with a three-deck headline. Three decks. Now, the newsletter always had only a two-deck headline. That was our style. I looked at the front page. Bobby had pushed, or pulled the first edition. George had put above the, the picture of the wee lad just about to be thrown into the River Thames, a headline. Winning boat race crew hold their cocks above their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. <laughs> and, uh, utterly <laughs> and sports says to me, what are you going to do? I says, I'll redraw the headline. I said, but pulp the rest of it. Pulp the rest of it. If that had a, the old traditional unionist paper, if that had it gone onto the streets, can you imagine uh, what, what would have happened from there? Well, there, was, there was newspapers pulled in those days for, for the like of that, and, and the Irish News, and to be fair, th right throughout the Troubles, all three newspapers yeah. continued to publish. But there was one day in the Irish News when they almost didn't publish, and it was back to the broadsheet days, and it was the old hot metal. And uh, there was a thing called the chase, which you, all the things that was put on, and you, everything was all painstakingly put in, back to front, because it had to be flipped over as all hot metal and different things. And it was called the chase. And it was like the paper, basically. And then you put, the, you, you locked it, and you, you put, you, you locked it up, so it was all closed up. And then you slid it off, it was called the stone, and then it went to the print press. But this day in the Irish News, and it was the front page, the paper was away, and it all done. And it was called the chase, the, this thing. And somebody who was meant to lock it hadn't actually locked it tight enough. They were sliding it off on the entire front page fell in bits, oh, you can imagine hot metal, onto the floor. And this was like, the, it was going to the press. And uh, in those days, again, before my time, but the, even the editor of the Irish News, everybody was down on their hands and knees and trying to put the whole front page together again. And the front page appeared, they got it back together again, got the paper printed. But there was loads of typos on the front page. Like, I mean, loads of typos. The headlines were all correct. But the actual type, because everything, all these minuscule little bits of hot metal, and it all fell on the floor basically before it was going, the whole, because the thing fell apart. Yeah. My favourite dodgy headline when I worked in the Andy Town News, there was foot and mouth at the time, and the bishop had cancelled Cemetery Sunday. And there was this wee man come up, his wife had not long died, and he was raging, he was a wee devout Catholic, and he wanted Cemetery Sunday, and this isn't the country, why would we stop it from foot and mouth? And the headline on the Monday paper was a picture of him at the gates of Milltown holding the gates open and says, I will beat the bishop. And then underneath it, in very small writing, they put on Cemetery Sunday. <laughs> and that was honest, that's a genuine headline. <laughs> well, the worst, the worst, the, the worst turn the, the, the Andy Town News did me, Squinder. Um, I, the old first book I brought out was called Godfathers about the rise of drugs and, you know, the, the, the change from them being 
murdering bastards and the drug dealers, uh, killing kids in the street. But um, it was called Godfathers. But Squinter did a review, and on top of the review, the headline, instead of reading Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll, it read Sex and Drugs and Jim Mado. <laughs> 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 My wife went bananas. <laughs> Where's Squinter? Where does he live? I'm going to kneecap him with my teeth. Where is he? Uh, we're supposed to be out of here at um, at half nine. Um, are there any questions? I, 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 you know, we didn't go into the serious stuff because I didn't. I wanted to be as informal as possible. We could have told you stories of the the worst the worst stories we have reported during the so-called troubles. Um, I, I think that after what happened last night, it kind of brings back to the four of us what we had seen in the streets before. You know, uh, Oxford Street, watching... watching. I'm still doing that. I had to work on Wednesday. Yeah, My daughter work, had been on right. Wednesday night, and in the middle of that, then that happened, and I'm covering covering that, and I actually thought that, that I am still doing this. That's right. I even said that to me. 2023, I'm still even reporting said that to me these stories. Me. is just insane. I really thought, at one, you know, that yes. the days of me reporting those type of murders now, but we do have now an increase in those gangland type shootings, which I've been reporting on, but that type of, of murder, I, or that type of attempted murder, and, and he's, he's critical, but in a, a bad way, I thought were behind me, like those days. Well, everybody did, Ivan, we talked about this earlier in the week. I know, I mean, it's, it's just, it, as you said, insane is the word. You know, I, mm. I, I probably, for my sins, covered more murders and funerals than anybody else, and on, because when I worked for UTV, I didn't want to go behind the scenes. I didn't want to be a news editor or a current affairs editor. I wanted to do the job on the ground. But you know, when I when I eventually took my voluntary redundancy from UTV, we thought we'd peace. But I lost a fortune because I kept betting the lads. This isn't a real peace. This is a peace, but it's not a genuine real peace. And I kept firing over money, but I want it back because we're still. We're still yeah. in the middle and of a what, what I will say about that, and you're saying that frontline reporting, when I'm doing that and was doing people who were murdered and going to their house, the greatest privilege as a journalist is when someone takes you into their home, when they're going through probably the worst time Absolutely. of their life, and they sit you down, and so hospitable. I mean, the Natalie McNally murder before Christmas, um, I went down in that family, and they made me tea and gave me biscuits, and were so warm and welcome. You thought you were a member of their family, mm -hmm. and sat there during what must be, like their pregnant yeah. daughter had been murdered, and such decent, lovely people. And it's such a, still to me, after all these years, I think, what a privilege that they trust you with their story. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, that, I, I, I think, I, I've wrapped sorry, it. guy. It, yeah, it, it does get you, it, it does get you. And uh, as I say, I'm a country boy, and we had limited trouble in, in my early days. We had lots of trouble in the, in the latter days, and the, the T-Ban explosion was a classic example. And people brought you into their houses, they wanted to talk to you about it. And it's, it's just so, as Alison said, these are people who are in, in the absolute depths of grief yeah. and they're prepared to talk to you and, and it's I lovely because, here's yeah. a, because they trust you. And I, I'm, I'm coming back to, it's the trusted word and uh, you know, and you're probably going to talk, Jim, about, um, you know, you move on to what online or whatever. But no, newspapers don't generally, don't have the time, Gary, but what anyway, we do this, is, this is, good. is trusted. This is good. If, if people lift the Belfast Telegraph, the Irish News, the newsletter, those papers invest in journalists. They trust what's in those papers. They do. And if and you say to someone, if yeah. you trust me until I prove myself wrong, and yes, don't speak to me absolutely. again if I don't, but yeah. then mm -hmm. you can trust me. And do you know what I also find is, people have go, would I let someone into my home in those circumstances? But remember when we're looking at headlines, you're saying you did 10 murders in one weekend. Those people are just names and statistics unless they do speak. And sometimes they go, I want you to go and tell people yeah. that he yeah. was my son and he was a great footballer and he was, and they wanted you to, to immortalise them almost right. as a real person yeah. rather yeah. than just yeah. Yeah. a say, statistic. I, I, I had dozen scores, probably hundreds of these interviews, but after the Enniskillen bomb, I'd been in London for the weekend with my daughter. My marriage had broken up and we used to go up to, we used to go to London regularly. But I got home and went to Enniskillen and rapped on Gordon Wilson's door. And the family, somebody came out and said, look, he's done it all. He's done all these interviews. He can't do anymore. And I was about to go and I heard this voice and it's that big Ivan from UTV. He recognized my voice and they said, yes, he said, bring him in. Brought me in, 
told me the story that he told quite a few times before. And at the end of it, I said to him, like, this is crazy. I said, yesterday I was at the Cenotaph in London with my daughter. I said, I can't imagine what you've gone through. Yeah. And I started to cry. I've, I don't, I've never really cried on, on a story. And he reached over and he held my hand and he comforted me. He'd lost his daughter and he was comforting me. And I thought, what a man. What a man. Just, just quickly in terms of humanity and then we're going to have to wrap up. I suppose the worst story, there were many that I had to do. And one of the worst ones, Alison, you say, go under the door. And one of the things that still haunts me, you go and wrap a door where a family's just been told that their father, their brother, husband or whatever has been, been murdered. And this keening, you can hear the crying, the Irish word, you know, keening. And you're standing at the, at the front door and this wheel is coming down the hall at you. And you almost feel like turning and running. What am I doing here? But the story has to be told. And uh, it was often yeah. they wanted you to tell the story. But the worst story I ever did, Johnny Adair sent two gunmen up to the Kennedy Way bin yard just after the Shankill bombing, which was vile and evil itself, um, uh, to kill. And they, they murdered two bin men having a cup of tea in the bin yard at Kennedy Way. And those days there were no mobiles ever. You had to go and find a phone box or you had to, you had to um, rap somebody's door and ask could you use their phone. And I ran up this street. Um, I met Joe Hendren and, and his wife had come and Joe had given me a couple of quotes. Not that that's what he was there for. He was there just because he was the politician for the area. And I rapped this door and this wee woman in a black cardigan came to the door and I explained who it was and said, can I use your phone, which was sitting in the hall, and I'll make a transfer charge call, so it doesn't cost you anything. So I was running the Ulster Press Agency at the time, and I was working for three newspapers, so I had to make three different calls, phoning copy through to the copy takers on the other end. But it was halfway through the second call, and the woman had gone into her living room, shut the door, I was standing in the hall. When Frank, when a knock came to the door, and it was Frank McCallum, an old mate of mine, who worked in the city hall and who was a top trade union representative. And I kind of said to the copy taker, hold on a minute, put the phone down, open the front door. And Frank McCallum said to me, Jim, what are you doing here? I said, I'm filing a copy from the shooting down in the bin yard. He said, I'm here to tell the woman in the, of the house, her husband's one of those who's been shot dead. And I'm standing there and I'm saying, Frank, please don't tell me this. Don't tell me this. And I said, Frank, I must go in with you and apologise to her. I don't want to do anything else. He says, Jim, just leave it alone. Just, just. And I walked in. I had already put a fiver under the phone just for letting, or letting me use the phone, even though it was transfer charge. And I turned around and like Ivan was saying, the old waterworks were flying. I just couldn't believe out of all the houses that I would randomly have selected that it was the house of this woman. And uh, I mean, her son contacted me afterwards and you know, I, I said, look, I'm sorry about all of this. And he said, we understand. But people were like that. But that's, that's one of the things. And listen, ju just to finish, um, this is under the auspices of the John Hewitt Society. And, and um, you know, they, they often say that his poetry um, was as close to journalism and journalism was as close, prose of journalism was as close to his poetry um, as it can get. So this is a poem that he wrote, uh, neither in an election nor a manifesto. It was recited on August the 28th at the 10th anniversary of the Oma bomb and at a little memorial plaque on the bomb site of the memorial garden, it still, it's, it still bears um, the last line of the poem, which is, bear in mind these dead. But just as an illustration of what we touched on maybe too late there, and this, is, this is just two verses out of the poem. Uh, say, say I say only, bear in mind, those men and lads killed in the streets but do not differentiate between those deliberately gunned down and those caught by unaddressed bullets. 
such distinctions are not relevant. Bear in mind the skipping child hit by the anonymous ricochet. The man shot at his own far side with his staring family round him. The elderly woman making tea for the firemen when the wall collapsed and the garrulous neighbours at the bar when the bomb exploded near them. The gesticulating deaf mute stilled by the, social, by the soldier's rifle in the town square and the policeman sorry, and the policeman dismembered by the booby trap in the car. Patriot, patriot, patriotism has to do with keeping the country in good heart, the community or, ordered with justice and mercy. These will enlist loyalty, loyalty and courage often and sacrifice sometimes even martyrdom. Bear these eventualities in mind also. They will concern you forever. But at this moment, bear in mind these dead. To me, that is the poetry of suffering and what is happening on the pulse beat of the pavement, married to the prose of the pavement and the people that we reported and many others reported in the papers. So thank you for coming here tonight. We really appreciate it. And I hope in some way we've given you something to think about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.